So many of you might remember back in October, November 2020, mainstream media and social media as well, the mainstream platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, etc., banning some of the, I guess you could say, kind of alternative media like the New York Post that were actually leaking the story about this laptop that leaked that showed Hunter Biden doing drugs and having sexual relations with prostitutes on camera and some of these videos were leaked too and people could actually even go watch like the videos and even though the videos were leaked and you could see it was hunter biden and you could see he was doing drugs on camera and you know having sex with prostitutes and all of this stuff even though you could see all that and it was all out in the open and all of these emails were leaked with you know with Hunter Biden and and, and all the corruption and then Joe Biden possibly being involved in all of this. And then Joe Biden, of course, you know, um, telling people in Ukraine, the officials that he was associated with uh, to fire the prosecutors and fire the people that were investigating the same corporations that his family, that Hunter Biden was involved with. And, you know, all of this coming out. And of course, it was supposedly not real. All of it was fake, right? It was it was a totally fake story that the New York Post made up or something. I, I don't even know what they were, what their their whole excuse was. And I remember you were banned on Twitter for sharing it. And the whole reason this was even stopped from coming out, or or it came out, but it was deemed to be quote unquote fake news, even though it had video evidence to support it, and, and all of this, you know, documents, files, all this stuff. Um. Still, they they called it fake. You were banned for supporting it. And now you have the New York Times reporting that, oh, actually, it's real. Two years later, well, one and a half years later, okay, it was real. Now that the election is far gone and over uh, at this point, you know, now they admit it's real. And, and it's obvious. Uh, they knew it was real the whole time, but it was uh, a censorship cover-up to – favor their guy in the election, Joe Biden. I don't know why they chose Joe Biden. I mean, honestly, like, anyways, you know, even, even if you're an elite, I mean, I I guess if you want the downfall of the American empire, then you would choose Joe Biden though. But anyway, so the mainstream media and uh, the official experts, the experts, the people who have master's degrees in journalism from your local state university that work at BuzzFeed, right? They... Um, had de- deemed it fake news, so so we accepted that as the truth, right? Now, now it's confirmed as real news. So, of course, media proven to have lied. Uh, and then you had, obviously, you could talk about the uh the Wuhan leak theory with with uh you know uh, the the COVID thing and whether or not you even buy into that fully because some people don't think you know any of it is. It, some people just think it's the flu, but hey, you know that's just their theory, right? But the whole thing is there were a lot of people and, in fact, a lot of American politicians like Rand Paul that were saying, hey, maybe we should look into this lab leak theory, the Wuhan Institute of Technology or what Wuhan Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China. You know, maybe this was a lab leak. And, and oh, look, uh, Fauci was involved in the NIH and EcoHealth Alliance and all this. And it came from this lab, it looks like. And, you know, there was a lot of evidence to support that, all of this, you know, that, you know, that it was engineered in some way. It was like a bioweapon, right? The whole COVID bioweapon theory out of Wuhan, China. Yeah. So that was deemed to be fake news. The mainstream media, the experts, the people who went to your local state university. Okay. They have a master's degree. Okay. And they get paid 60 grand a year to type up stories in their, their apartment in New York city for the New York times or something. And, uh, yeah, they were proven to have been totally wrong or lying about that because now it's pretty much generally i mean it's it's a lot more accepted as a possibility at this point that even if you think that that's true you're not crazy i mean there's evidence to back that up i don't even know if i believe that per se i'm just saying there's evidence to back it up and the fact that the media was uh, just shown over you know the months i would say years but it's only been like a year and a half since this theory really came out maybe 2 years uh, it's been shown that, you know, this is viable. This is reasonable. This isn't unreasonable to think this. So media proven to be wrong again. So over and over again, I mean, I can go on forever and ever and ever and ever. I mean, uh, the fact that, I mean, if you want to talk about war, we can talk about war. The fact that the media was all behind the weapons of mass destruction lie that got us into Iraq. So you have to understand the people who are credible are the people who are skeptical of the media. We're the credible ones. We're the ones that have the credibility now. Okay, we're in charge now. 
we're in charge, right? So you better get used to it, all right? So throw away your stupid degree, right? And start watching Resisting the Reset, bitches. Because let me tell you, we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about this right now. This Russian bio lab thing. I'm just seeing the stories in the media and, and people talking about it, and you know, it's it's being deemed a Russian disinformation conspiracy theory. It isn't real. There's no bio labs in Ukraine. And then well, well, so, he, so this is how some, sometimes it evolves, though. So at first, the media said this, right? The media said, fact check, false claim of U.S. bio labs in Ukraine tied to Russian disinformation campaign. This is out of USA Today. Now, this is very complicated and nuanced. I'm not going to say either way because I don't, I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not pro-Russian. And I'm also not pro-Ukraine either. Just for, just, just so you people know, just so you people know, right? And I, I have people on both sides that hate me for this. They hate me. They hate me that I'm not like for the Azov battalion fighting for the white race or something. Because yes, the main battalions in Ukraine that are anti-separatists, that are anti-Russian separatists, the one, the ones that were fighting the Russian separatists in Donetsk and Lubansk and all of that in eastern Ukraine, they were and are neo-Nazis, okay? That's fine, whatever. All right, so all you people with flying the Ukraine flag, supporting the people fighting the uh, Russians, you're in bed with Nazis, just so you know, fine. Hey, I don't hate you for it because I'm not like a uh, spurging uh, leftist calling everybody a Nazi and demonizing anybody who wants to even associate or talk to anybody that, that I disagree with. Um, you know, if you want to associate with people who want to, you know, b- proliferate the right white race in Ukraine, fine. That's that's your prerogative. Just know that when you go and you do that, you're the biggest hypocrite ever because you're the same people that will call everybody Nazis and say how you want to fight the Nazis and hate the Nazis. And then that, now you're siding with the Nazis. So, okay, whatever. Um, but... I'm also not pro-Russian because, hey, they just invaded a country. Like, I mean, you you just don't do that. That's very, I mean, in my book, that's aggression. Like, I I know there's all kinds of, like, theories. Like, the one I'm going to show you here where Russia is uh, saying that there's U.S. bio labs in Ukraine. That's why they're they're invading, part of the reason why they're invading, you know, because, you know, there was uh, dangerous experiments going on uh, here and this, that, and the other. I don't even know. Maybe that's true. I don't even know. Uh, all I know is it could even be disinformation too from the Russians. Like this is war. Like of course. Like I mean, we lied to get into Iraq. Why wouldn't Russia lie to do this? You know, I'm sure they they really have like a um a, a very pro-Russian agenda, right? Obviously, right? And, and they want to expand Russia. They want you know if you read like Alexander Dug and they believe in the fourth political theory and you know. Uh, it, 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 there, there's some validity to what, you know, Dugan talks about in terms of a, like a fourth political theory is needed. Yeah, yes, I agree. But, but then he wants to make, you know, the USSR, uh, back to, to that, uh, Russian Federation USSR type thing. It's very expansionist, but Hey, look, so we're going to look at this. And so the point here is we're going to go over the, some of the new information that, you know, these people, the Russian ambassador presented to the UN security council. Uh, I'm going to read it here out of this article and then we're gonna uh then we're gonna talk about how how there, there, there's at least an element of truth in what they're saying at least an element of truth um and the fact that the media is lying to you about it and the real point of why i'm showing you this really is to show how the media is lying to you right right and and you got to open your mind here you got to understand like like Someone like me, I'm not presenting this to be pro-Russia or anti-Ukraine or or pro-Ukraine or anti-Russia or anything like that. I'm just saying the mainstream media is lying to you. You need to do your own research and you need to trust really the people who have your best interests at heart. Regular people like me that maybe even sometimes might get it wrong, but I, I'm not like paid by special interest groups or the CIA or corporations or, you know, by sponsors or any of this stuff. I'm just showing you the information as I see it. You know, that's valuable in the, today's day and age. Every, there's always an influence. There's always a uh, special interest involved. Not here though, not at resisting the reset, and not, you know, at many other places too. You can look online, you know. But let's read out of this article. I think this is originally out of Gateway Pundit. This is Jim Hoft, right? So they say, the Russian ambassador to UN Security Council, Vasily Nebinza, or 
Nabenza? Nabenzia charged that a U.S. implemented program of biological research in Ukraine may have triggered uncontrollable and dangerous infections in Ukraine, including rubella, diphtheria, I cannot say that, tuberculosis, measles, polio, and swine flu during his speech last week. Uh, Nabenzia added that by May, or I'm sorry, March 2016, a total of 364 people died of swine flu in Ukraine. And you know what's really interesting? Um, just a side note here, I remember reading stories around that time, and it might have actually been before that. It might have been, I remember it, it was it was sometime, I think it was like in 2009 actually, when there was that swine flu thing. A lot of, there was a lot of theories that are originated in Ukraine. Um, back during the Obama administration, you might remember the swine flu scare. It wasn't like a COVID thing. It was, it was a lot, it was more of a test run for the COVID thing, right? But, um, it was a lot more tame, but, uh, yeah, that, that was a big, uh, deal during that time. And it looks like March too of 2016, we had a swine flu th thing happening in, uh, Ukraine too. But I remember reading those articles. So there is elements of truth to that. At the very least I can say. And they go on to say here, while the U.S. itself shut down military purpose biological research on its territory due to high risks it posed to American population, the Kiev authorities actually agreed to turn their country into a biological testing site and have their citizens use as potential test subjects, according to Nabenzia. Nabenzia, I have a feeling, am I saying that right? Nabenzia? Materials confiscated by the Russian Defense Ministry prove that all serious high-risk research in Ukraine biolabs was directly supervised by U.S. experts who had diplomatic immunity. I'm going to show you that there's probably some truth to that. Now, the, the, the real question is, is were these weaponized facilities? I mean, that is a theory, right? I can show you the actual congressional acts passed that show that many of these sort of NGO-type groups, almost like EcoHealth Alliance, right, where it's not... Uh, government but but it's like but it's like quasi government groups um and organizations were funding biolabs in Ukraine so that this is true and I'm going to show you that I'm going to prove that to you even though the media says it's false it is true now whether or not it's weaponized is really the the question if you really want the truth. I mean, that, that is a theory. If you want to say there's weapons being made there, okay, we're, we're jumping a little bit to conclusion, but it's very reasonable to assume that that was happening since a lot of these labs and facilities, according to the actual congressional acts, like the U.S. Freedom Act of 1992, that goes on to say these were actually former Soviet bioweapons labs in Ukraine. And what the U.S. did when the when the Soviet Union dis dissolved is they came in with these sort of quasi-government groups like the U.S. Civilian Research and Development Foundation. Yeah, these groups were used to turn these biolabs, these weaponized biolab facilities into sort of like non-weaponized biolab facilities according to the official, you know, Congressional acts and, you know, uh, earmarks of how the funds are used sort of thing. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's just like, maybe it's just like, okay, yeah, they're not weaponized anymore, but like under the, the radar, they're kind of like, okay, we'll wep we'll, maybe we'll weaponize some of them. Okay. We'll have a little secret department here where some of that is weaponized. I'm not saying it's very, very reasonable to assume that. I mean, but so that's what the, what the, what the Russians are saying here. Um, so uh, blah, 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 supervised by U.S. experts. And the article goes on to state, during wartime, Russian claims must be viewed with the same degree of skepticism as those of all other warring parties. That's, that's true. Nonetheless, due to the seriousness of the charges and since its, its substance has been completely ignored by the mainstream media, the Gateway Pundit documented in the, the entire speech in an earlier post. On Friday, the Russian ambassador presented more evidence against the United States at the UN Security Council. Nabenzia accused the U.S. of funding components of biological weapons created in the territory of Ukraine. Citing the P-781 project that was studied, the Russians alleged that the U.S. was experimenting with the transmission of human uh, the, the transmission to humans of diseases through bats. 
Six families of viruses were identified, including coronaviruses. The Russians made a similar similar accusation last week. The U.S. responded, this is malarkey. There are no biological weapon programs in Ukraine. This is a dark conspiracy theory. See, when I hear that, that makes me think just right off the bat that it, that it's probably true. Whenever they're, whenever they're calling something a conspiracy theory, it's, it's almost lost its touch at this point. You remember like 10 years ago, if you were deemed a conspiracy theorist or said the word conspiracy theory, it discredited something. Now it sort of highlights it. Even in the average person mind, average person's mind, I feel like, that wants nothing to do with politics, wants nothing to do with any of the culture war or anything like that. They hear conspiracy theory now and they're like, well, you know, some of those are true, you know? It's 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 kind of lost its touch. So it, when I hear that, it's almost like, okay, they're trying really hard to, you know, uh, put forth this boomer narrative of like, if something's a conspiracy theory, it must not be true. Because now, you know, people now hear that and like, well, maybe it is true, right? Because other other, you know, other than that, they probably just ignore it. But if they're, they're going out of their way to call it a conspiracy theory and Russian disinformation, that just tells me it might be true. I don't know. Uh, Russia, Russia also accuses the West of a false flag operation. Yeah, everybody's just pointing fingers, fingers now, call, saying, you know, this is a false flag. That was a false flag. Do you remember when even thinking false flags were a thing made you a conspiracy theorist? Now you have official officials. I remember it was the director of... What was it, the um, defense secretary? I did it. I did a, a video on it like like a month ago, before the Russians decided to invade Ukraine. This is like a the month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, about how. Oh man, I think it was the Secretary of Defense in the Biden administration. You can look at. You can look at. Or was it the director of this? I don't, I don't even remember honestly. He's the Biden guy, right? He's a, he, he's in the U.S. government, and he's going on to say that he thinks that uh, the Russians are going to stage a false flag as an excuse to invade Ukraine. Now the Russians are saying the U.S. are staging false flags. Everybody's staging false flags now, and everybody's just pointing fingers because, you know, the beans have been spilt that false flags are real and that, you know, nations use these, these psychological, you know, operations as justification for the evil things that they do to take away your freedoms, to invade nations, to, uh, tax people, to tax the, the, you know, the little guy, all of these things. Yeah. It's the word sort of out cats out of the bag. So now they're just going to point fingers at each other and say, ah, oh, you're the one that did it. You're the one that did it. So false flag, false flag. You know, they used to all say it was fake. Now they're all calling each other false flag perpetrators. It's funny. False, you're the false flagger, man. You're the f- false flagger. I love it. Um. Yeah. Ba 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 ba. So they're talking about all this stuff, you know. I don't know. So what I want to talk about here is, first of all, that could all be Russian disinfo. I mean, not necessarily. Like I said, part, it's partly true either way. But you know, if they're gonna go on to say that, oh, there was coronavirus testing at, in Ukraine with bats and human transmission. It's almost like they're trying to replay the whole Wuhan um, Institute of Virology bio lab leak theory that happened supposedly in China, but they're trying to say it was Ukraine. And it's kind of like they're rehashing this old narrative of COVID that, that it's not an old narrative. Trust me. I mean, COVID, we're, this is something we're going to have to deal with for a while with yearly attempted lockdowns and, and all of this stuff and, you know, vaccine requirements and stuff. This is something like, like after 9-11, we had the war on terror for like a decade, two decades. Yeah, this is going to be like with the COVID now. So they're kind of like rehashing that narrative in new Ukraine. It does kind of smell fishy when they're, it's, it sort of seems played out like, oh, we're going to talk about coronaviruses and bats and humans and the transmission and bio labs and all this in Ukraine. I mean, to me, it does sound a little bit Russian disinfo to me, but that's okay because the whole narrative from the media is this, that even any talk of bio labs in Ukraine at all is a conspiracy theory in Russian disinfo. That's not true because there is an element of it that is true. So, you have here out of the USA Today, fact check, false claim of U.S. biolabs in Ukraine tied to Russian disinformation campaign. Oh. So, you know, they, they go on here. 
They say that it's a conspiracy theory that there are Russian or that there are that there are bio, bio labs in Ukraine funded by the U.S. government. There are, there are one hundred percent. So, um, first of all, they even said for a while there's no bio labs. Like there were, the the media was first saying that there's no bio labs in Ukraine. And they said, oh, there's no U.S. bio labs in Ukraine. And then they were like, oh, wait, oh, wait, there's no like direct U.S. government or military bio labs in Ukraine. Then, then they were saying, oh, there's no U.S. bio weapons labs in Ukraine. So, so it's like always evolving. It's like they're, they're uh, <laughs> what do you call it? They're, 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 they're moving the goalposts every time, right? They're moving the goalposts. They're saying, well, okay, fine. Oh, there's bio labs, but they're not U.S. military, okay? Okay, it's bio labs, but they're not bioweapons facilities. Oh, okay. So that's what, so this is one of the first ones. There's no U.S. bio labs, debunked, whatever. Yeah, fake news. This is fake news. There are, there are, definitely. So now you have here, Marco Rubio asking Victoria Newland about this biolab thing. Now, at this time, the media was saying there's no biolabs in Ukraine. Now, Victoria Newland, former, um, was it Secretary of State? Uh, Obama administration, obviously. Victoria Newland, you know, she was in the Obama administration, okay? I think she was Secretary of, St- I don't know. Someone refresh my memory, please. I don't. I don't really care to be honest. She was in the because she was highly involved in the last Ukraine conflict in 2014 too. She's the one that, you know, was like, oh yeah, after Yanukovych is is ousted, we're gonna have control of who's put in place there in Ukraine and in the new government once Yanukovych is out of there. So, but anyway, so she goes on to say, yeah, okay, there's bio labs in Ukraine, and we're afraid the Russians are gonna use it uh, as 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 a as a vector to attack people in Ukraine. They're going to use it um, to release bioweapons on the Ukrainians, right? Right. But wait a minute. I thought there were no bioweapons there. Now, how can it be used as a weapon if they're just regular biolabs? And, and for, I didn't even know. I thought the media was telling me those didn't exist at all, right? So check it out. Well, um, I only have a minute left. Let me ask you. Um, does Ukraine have chemical or biological weapons? Uh Ukraine has uh, biological research facilities, which, in fact, we are now quite concerned Russian troops, Russian forces may be seeking to uh, gain control of. So we are working with the Ukrainians on how they can prevent any of those research materials from falling into the hands of uh, Russian forces should they approach. I- I'm sure you're aware that the Russian propaganda t- groups are already putting out there all kinds of information about how they've uncovered a plot by the Ukrainians to release biological weapons in the country and with NATO's coordination. If there's a biological or chemical weapon incident or uh, or attack inside of Ukraine, is there any doubt in your mind that 100 percent it would be the Russians that would be behind it? There is no doubt in my mind, Senator, and it is classic Russian uh, technique to blame on the other guy what they're planning to do themselves. So I guess that's a Russian technique. I didn't, I, I, okay. So first of all, just look up the Gulf of Tonkin. The United States does this too. Russia does it too. They all do it. All the major governments of the world, militaries, I should say, of the world do this. It's called a false flag operation. I mean, everybody knows, right? So, um, you know, the U.S., it's not a Russian thing. The U.S. did it to get us into the war in Vietnam in the 60s, okay? They staged a fake incident called the Gulf of Tonkin, and it was declassified 100% back in the 2000s that this was a false flag op, right? So, there you go. We do it, too. We all do it. They all do Hey, we all do it. We all do it, right? We all do it. So... Now, let's talk a little bit about, well, let's talk about the the Freedom Support Act first. The Freedom Support Act of 1992. Now, what this was, was uh, an act by Congress to sort of take advantage of this situation after the fall of the Soviet Union with different sort of government facilities and research labs as well 
especially biological and chemical research facilities. And mainly there were bioweapon facilities that the Soviet Union uh, had in Ukraine and a few of the other surrounding countries that were part of the USSR. Now, the whole idea was to take these facilities and turn them into a more civilian-supported or, or, or like less militarized version of themselves, right? And there were bioweapons and chemical weapons facilities. So, so it's kind of like, okay, we're going to try to make this, at least on the surface, more of a civilian operation, right? So they did this, especially in Ukraine, and they did this through groups, sort of like these NGO-type groups, these organizations um, that were created to foster growth in the former Soviet Union and some of these labs and facilities. Um, one of them was called the U.S. Civilian Research and Development Foundation. Um, another one was called the Armadian School Connectivity Program. Um... So they were funded by the U.S. government, but also private organizations, which made them not technically government organizations. So in other words, you had guys like George Soros come in and fund like the U.S. Uh, Civilian Research and Development Foundation, along with the Department of State, right? Um, so because these groups, these organizations were funneled money from private people and the governments, um, they weren't considered necessarily government groups. So that's where they get around that loophole of it being, okay, they're biolabs, but they're not U.S. government biolabs. It's like, okay, these organizations are like middlemen between government, guys like George Soros and stuff. They're, they're Western, like, I mean, this is the government. Like when you're talking about like high profile private people like Soros, like by the way, the CDC, um, that funneled money through some of these organizations. Um, it's, it's, I mean, when you say it's a U.S. biolab or U.S. funded or a U.S. operation, I think that's fairly accurate to say. Like, if you want to get people on a technicality and say like, oh, they're not actually government groups that are, that are funneling money into these, uh, biolabs. Okay. So debunked, like that's not debunked, okay? We're speaking colloquially. They're U.S. biolabs. Many of them are, right? Just because they're, look, look at some of these groups. The, the CRDF, that's the Civilian Research and Development Foundation, not only had money from the Department of State funneled through them to these biolabs in Ukraine, but also the Institute, the National Institute of Health. Oh, what were they connected to? Ah, Fauci and EcoHealth Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China. There is a connection there. Who else funnels the CRDF uh, global money? The CDC. Um, the USDA, right? So, so, so these are some of the Pacific Northwest so these are some of the groups that, that funnel money through this organization into these biolabs. So um, you also had the um, the Noon Luger Act of 2005. So this was a um, initiative passed in 2005. So mm, this article was on the state. This is out of Africa Press. Uh, they say, moreover, talks about establishing the, uh, the, this biolab in Ukraine date back to 2005, according to an archived Noon Luger report edition from August of that year. Back then, Luger, that's one of the senators, and fellow Senator Barack Obama were coordinating efforts with Ukrainian authorities to help uh, to study and help to prevent the spread of the avian flu. Coincidentally, avian flu is one of the pathogens that Kiev laboratories were studying and studying in the context of potential spread of dangerous pa pathogens via bird migration from Ukraine and Russia. Russian Defense Ministry findings suggested. Eventually, Ukraine signed an agreement with the U.S. under the Noon Luger Act, which sought to remove weapons of mass destruction from the former Soviet states and agreed to the construction of a modern laboratory for handling and studying dangerous pathogens on its territory. 
despite eventually admitting that the price... Oh, you guys probably can't see this whole thing, huh? Okay, here we go. Despite eventually admitting that the presence of the U.S.-funded biolabs uh, in Ukraine, Victoria Newland did not consider Russians' accusations about experiments on modifying dangerous pathogens and turning them into biological weapons. At the time, she said Washington was quite concerned with the prospect of the Russian military seizing these laboratories during their special operation territory in Ukraine. On Ukrainian territory, I should say. So... Um, so yeah, if you just look at the Noon Luger Act of 2005, you know, it, it was declassified that, you know, even direct government funds were, were sort of funneled into biolab operations in Ukraine. And Barack Obama was behind a lot of it. Isn't that interesting? Before he was president, Senator Barack Obama at the time. Hmm. And that, so, so all these connections, all these connections, isn't it just like so intriguing? And then what's this? What's this? Ah, new foundation to support research collaborations between the U.S. and states of the former Soviet Union. Mm. Yes, a unique public-private partnership to strengthen scientific and technological collaboration between the U.S. and the states of the former Soviet Union has begun to work with a first meeting to set priorities and policies. The board of directors of the U.S. Civilian Research and Development Foundation, which we just talked about, for the independent states of the former Soviet Union, held its first meeting September 13th and 14th at the National Science Foundation. The CRDF was announced by President Clinton back uh, on May 10th in Moscow and established by the National Science Foundation under a congressional authorization. The CRDF is funded by a $5 million gift to NSF from philanthropist George Soros and a $5 million matching contribution from the Department of Defense. The initial, 10, the initial $10 million fund will support basic and applied research efforts and promote defense conversion and developments of markets of market economies in the countries of the former Soviet Union. All research propo- proposals funded by the CRDF will be selected competitively through merit review. Hmm. Well, George Soros, Department of Defense, 1995, the Obamas. Hmm. Yeah. You know, it's really funny. It's really funny reading all this and sort of um, thinking about how... During the Obama administration, you had the civil war in Ukraine, the ousting of Yanukovych, the whole debacle in the Ukraine supposed revolution, the color revolution essentially in Ukraine, where they kicked out Yanukovych and put in their own NATO puppet, where Victoria Nuland even said right before Yanukovych was fully ousted, oh, you know, we need to control who gets put in once he's gone. And we need to control this government, right? So, and that happened. And then under President Trump, everything was quiet. Everything shut up in Ukraine. Now, of course, there was still some, a little bit of fighting going on, but it wasn't at all to the degree of what it was during the Obama administration. And then as soon as Trump is out of office, and you have the Biden administration in there, all of a sudden, the whole thing heats back up. Huh, isn't that interesting? And then all of Biden's connections, and his son, Hunter Biden, his connections to Ukraine and some of the corruption there. Yeah, isn't this all like kind of interesting? And then these connections with Soros and needless to say, the Democrats. It makes you wonder... Is this a conspiracy, you know? And like, I do not support the Russians. In fact, you know, I, I think the Russians should leave most of Ukraine alone. Maybe just take back the East, right? Okay, you got some separatist regions, take them back. Crimea, Levant, Donetsk, the Donbass region. I don't know why they don't just take that and then shut up, right? But they, no, they're, they're, they're going into Kiev, whatever. Okay, look, I'm not Russia. I don't, uh, you know... They're going to do what they're going to do. Uh, But I'm not in Ukraine. Maybe if I was Ukrainian, I'd be be pissed. But I'm not. I'm American, so I don't care. Um, 
So, you know, I look at all this though and it's like, and then I see the war propaganda and I see all of these calls for us to get our military involved. And then I get really upset. I get really upset and I get really concerned because the last thing I want is American soldiers dying on Eastern European soil for basically no reason other than, you know, uh, elitists playing pawns on a chessboard, really, on on this uh, geopolitical grand chessboard of the Eurasian you know, continent. And it's really, it really sickens me. You know, you, you get all these good old boys from the South, you know, they're 18 years old. They join the military. I mean, it's not only good old boys from the South, but you, you understand what I'm saying. You get, you get all these Americans, right? You know, guys I grew up with, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters, they get them to join the military and they use them for their own selfish, evil motives. It has nothing to do with American interests of the American people, right? This, you know, there's nothing good to come out of Ukraine. If anything, you, you might be able to make a, make an argument, you know, having Ukraine part of NATO might help Germany or something, but it's not going to help America. You know, it has nothing to do with America. It's a power play for Western elitists versus the Russian elitists, right? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how the, you know, uh, the Jewish Israelis are involved too, by the way, uh, playing, bo- playing both sides. You know, a lot of people will think, oh, you know, uh, Israel and America are, are, are so uh, close and, you know, Israel is going to always take America's side and vice versa. But you got Israel kind of taking Russia's side in this, just so you all know. We're kind of playing both sides, really, because there's a lot of Jews, Jewish oligarchs in, in Russia. Um, and there's a lot of Nazis in Ukraine fighting for the Ukraine uh, anti-separatists, I should say, the, an- the fighting for the anti-separatists, right? So, so, you know, it's complicated, guys. You know, it's a weird. So, big thanks, by the way, to uh, L. Uh, that's some bitch I know on Gab. Just does phenomenal research, unbelievable research. Like really, um, and you know, I'm getting a lot of this from some of her. Uh, some of this research I'm getting from her. Her Gab. Follow her on Gab at some bitch I know. Another one of these, not not just the CRDF, but also the Science and Technology Center in Ukraine. That's another one of these, right? Intergovernmental organizations dedicated to this initiative, right? This sort of quasi-government initiative where they're funding sort of bio labs and stuff through George Soros money and State Department money, right? Just so you know. That's another one worth noting. Um, so... You know, you got you got everybody saying like, see the lemmings just follow. They just follow what the media tells them to believe, man. It's really kind of sad. I had a a Facebook debate. It's stupid. I haven't had one of these in so long, not since like 2012. Like I learned my lesson. Like you're not gonna convince anybody on Facebook. But I decided. Like I woke up in the morning. This is this morning, right? And it was like. I see the mayor of my hometown, right? This guy is the biggest dweeb in the world. And, um, he's up there on his Facebook page, the official mayor. (sighs) I'm not going to say his name because he's just such a dweeb. Oh, like, I really hate this guy. And, and he, um, you know, he's just your typical, like hardcore leftist. And, um, he's like, Oh, we're going to have a march in the hometown I won't say the hometown, but we're going to have, it's just, it's just like a small city slash town in Massachusetts. It's kind of like, it's technically a city, but it's kind of, it's like a small, small city. Uh, it's like a mill town city. And he's like, yeah, we're going to have this march in, in our hometown here to support Ukraine and wave our Ukrainian flags in the middle of Massachusetts. Like, like this is what it pisses me off. This guy has no clue, right? He has not a clue, right? So I'm just like, bro, you're a leftist. You love Joe Biden. You hate Donald Trump. You hate the Nazis. You hate the racists. Okay, that's great. Just so you know, when you support Ukraine, and I don't have a problem with this. Like, I know people who support Ukraine. Like, I get it. You're literally supporting neo-nazis just you know like the the main battalion fighting the separatists 
in Ukraine are the Azov Battalion, and they are neo-Nazis. Not just like, oh, good old boy shooting guns in America, voting for Trump, believe in the Constitution, what the leftists call Nazis. I mean, like, literal wearing swastikas on their chest Nazis, okay? The, what do you call it, the, um, the Aryan Sun or whatever they call it, you know, the... They're, they they are literal neo-Nazis, like waving Nazi flags. Not just like, you know, oh, oh, look at him. He's wearing a Trump hat. He's a Nazi. Okay, that's not a real Nazi, boys, right? A real Nazi is like literally like doing the Roman salute, shaving their head, having like swastika tattoos on their chest, right? Saying, I hate N-words, Okay. The, those are real Nazis. They want the proliferation of the white race. Okay, this is what we're talking about, right? So, and I showed them. I showed them articles from mainstream sources, like the Azov Battalion, are the ones fighting the separatists in Ukraine. These are the ones you're supporting when you're going to fight with, the, you know, the the Ukrainians. We stand for Ukraine. Well, you're standing in unison and sol- solidarity in solidarity with neo Nazis. You know, they'll go on and they'll go on to um call you an evil white supremacist for having a conversation with somebody like, I don't know, Nick Fuentes, right? Who's just like like a Christian, edgy, young, like America first type dude who's against immigration. Okay, so you're saying nobody can even interview that guy, even though he's just like a pro-American, like like regular kid uh, that just so happens to be kind of edgy and be against immigration. Um, but you know, but you can go and say you support, you know, these militaristic literal Nazis that are fighting the Russians in Ukraine. So you can associate with them, but like somebody like me or or really anybody, if they even interview somebody like Richard Spencer or Nick Fuentes or millennial woes or any of these dudes, but uh, Ramsey Paul, you know, some of these guys in the sort of American alt, right? I guess you could say, I don't know. That's kind of like a played out term, but you know, they're, they're just totally evil to even have a conversation with them. But you can go and like send your money to neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Support Ukraine to fight the Russians, which well, I don't even know. Like the Russians, I can't think of anything bad about the Russians except for the fact that they're invading countries, which is bad. But I mean, other than that, I mean, like, like they're, they're not like calling for the... Like, the uh, like the, the the murder of like, you know, ethnicities and stuff like that. So so I'm just saying, all right? Anyways, moving on. Uh, CIA admits to training uh, Nazi terror groups in Ukraine, which have been fighting and killing Russians since 2015. Yeah. Uh, this is not a natural news, but this is all true. You know, this is something I've is well known. This isn't even like a conspiracy theory, you know? But anyway, I was sharing this information with the mayor, and uh, I, I have to finish this little story. I have to finish... With the mayor on Facebook, right? The good, good old mayor of my hometown. Just sharing, okay, you're supporting the Azov Battalion. Just so you know, they're Nazis. So he responds by saying, oh, you think you're an expert. Everybody thinks they're an expert. They're not an expert. You know, he's shared like one of those Forrest Gump memes. Like yesterday, everybody thought they were an expert in, um, you know, uh, medical vaccination or whatever. Today, everybody thinks they're an expert in foreign affairs. And it's like, dude, you don't have to... This this isn't a complicated issue. Like, I'm not trying to say I'm an expert. I'm just saying, like, they're neo-Nazis fighting for the the Ukrainians. Like, And so he goes on... I'm not even kidding you. I'm not going to show you the actual threat, but maybe I should... eh, No, I'm not going to, but... He goes on to post pictures of his bookshelves. This is his response. He, He posts pictures of his bookshelves saying I've read more than you I know more than you I'm smarter than you I have I have a master's degree from the London School of Economics it took me three years um it only and I was like dude (laughs) like what do you even say to like some of this stuff like you show me he sent like 10 pictures of his of his bookshelves saying that he reads all these books. It was really weird. This is the mayor of a town that I'm having a Facebook debate with. Anyways, it just shows how far gone people are. Like, you cannot make this stuff up. You just can't make it up. I I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's absurd. So, this is out of natural news. They say... 
Ukraine has been a hotbed of anti-Russian terrorism since 2015, and the culprit is none other than the CIA. The Central Intelligence Agency, also known as the Deep State Central. Okay, Natural News is a bit of a conspiracy website, I will admit that. Um, but a lot of this information is true, just so you know, because I, I've, this is something I follow for a long time. This is all, this is all true. Um, uh, is also linked, uh, the deep state central, uh, is also linked to a neo-Nazi terrorism group in, in many other countries as well. Wherever you see the extremism pop up seemingly out of nowhere, the CIA is likely involved. It's true. We saw them involved with the Mujahideen and then that involved into, you know, the Taliban and Al Qaeda and all this stuff. Um, quote, the U.S. government has a well-documented history of backing extremist groups as part of a panoply of foreign policy misadventures, which inevitably end up blowing up in the American public's face, writes Bronco Marseille of Jacobin magazine. In the 1960s, the CIA worked with Cuban anti-Fidel Castro radicals who turned Miami into a hotbed of terrorist violence. In the 1980s, the agency supported and encouraged Islamic radicals converging in Afghanistan who would go on to orchestrate the September 11th attacks. And in the 2010s, Washington backed Syria's not-so-moderate rebels who ended up cutting a swath of atrocities through civilians and the Kurdish forces that were meant to be U.S. allies. According to Yahoo News, the CIA has been secretly training forces in Ukraine since 2015 to serve as insurgent leaders, to quote one former intelligence official. This was done in, uh, just in case Russia ended up invading the country, which has now happened. So again, this is according to Yahoo News. Yeah, the CIA has been training these Azov forces in Ukraine since 2015. The claim that uh, the claim is that all this training is purely for intelligence collection. However, the former officials told Yahoo that the program is much more militaristic than that, involving the use of firearms, cover and move, camouflage, and more. Given the facts, there's a good chance that the CIA is training actual, literal Nazis as part of this effort. <coughs> The Russia-Ukraine conflict is much more complex than the media is letting on. It turns out that in 2015 was the same year that Congress just so happened to pass a spending bill that included hundreds of millions of dollars in economic and military support for Ukraine. Much of that cash was specifically designated for the country's resident neo-Nazi militia called the Azov Regiment. The initial version of the text explicitly explicitly barred arms training and other assistance to Azov. However, the House committee in charge of the bill was pressured by the Pentagon several months later to remove that language, calling it redundant. Gee whiz, I wonder why. A former commander of the group once stated that its historic mission in Ukraine is to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade for their survival in a crusade against the semi-led undermension. <laughs> Yo, you, wait till you guys see some of this gravy I'm about to give you. Wait till you guys see some of this. In 2014, the Azov was incorporated into Ukraine's National Guard. Quote, U.S. arms have flown to the militia. Mar Mar Marsic adds, Mar Marketic ads. NATO and the U.S. Uh, military officials have uh, been pictured meeting with them, and members of the militia have talked about their work with U.S. trainers and the lack of background screening to weed. <laughs> to, no, I'm just kidding. To weed out uh, white supremacists. Um, <laughs> to weed. I don't know. I just I like cracking jokes, boys. Officials in D uh, Washington, D.C. insist that Ukraine needs arms, cash, and other resources to fend off Russia, likening Va Vladimir Putin to Adolf Hitler. The, ar the irony is that the U.S. is backing the actual neo-Nazis in Ukraine, which is both confusing and conflicting. It's no small irony that the U.S. president elected in a large part to halt the perceived march of fa fascism at home is continuing long-standing U.S. support for literal Nazis and what might be the nexus of international fascism.
And if these Ukrainian Nazis really are among the insurgents being trained by the CIA, it will be no small tragedy if they one day take the same trajectory as uh, trajectory as Osama bin Laden. So, so that is, you know, that's a great predict- prediction to make that 10 years down the road, it makes sense that, you know, maybe, maybe Ukraine will win, right, somehow, because of the backing of NATO. Then all of a sudden, Ukraine becomes like the next real Nazi Germany with neo-Nazis in charge, right? Who do you think is going to be in charge? Who do you think the re- regime is going to put in charge? I bet you it ain't going to be Zelensky because I'm pretty sure he's, a, he's Jewish, right? So... It could be like someone highly influenced by the Azov Battalion, um, and, and Zelensky. By the way, I've t- I've talked about this. Zelensky panders quite a bit to the Azov Battalion because you know a lot of people will say neo Nazis well are like hate all Jews, but they'll work with Jews, man. Like they they are they, they don't care. It's really about power, right? Like if you see what what Hitler was doing even in Nazi Germany like he had Jews working for him in, in like the, the the Nazi regime you know what i mean like like Jewish scientists and stuff um because if they were useful to him they you know they would they would see past some of that stuff it was about using people really i you know so i mean Jews are really smart so you know some of these uh supposed you know these 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 Nazis and stuff neo Nazis yeah they'll, they'll they'll make deals with 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 the Jews you know it wouldn't surprise me at all just so you know i mean um now what's really interesting about this is because of the sanctions placed by the U.S. on Russia, you have a lot of Jewish oligarchs that have to, that that are having to step down from like their corporations and their nonprofits because of their residency and connection to the Russian regime. Right, Putin has a lot of Jewish oligarchs around him. Um, and um, a lot of these, these, these Jews, because of the sanctions now, are kind of in trouble. Some of them are actually fleeing, uh, fleeing to Israel. It's really kind of interesting. And if you're looking at Israel's reaction to all this, like the whole invasion of Ukraine, they're kind of playing both sides. They're pandering a bit to Russia because they have a lot of Jews there, a lot of Jewish nationals, and they have a lot of relations with Russia uh, and in and, and the U.S. too. Obviously, they get like a lot of money from the U.S. So they're kind of like having to, you know, n- sort of not take a stance uh, because they're in the middle. They don't want to just tell the United States to go screw and join Russia because then, you know, the tens of billions of dollars in foreign aid that comes from the United States will suddenly disappear, right? Well, maybe it wouldn't because Biden's just totally dumb. Um, but you know, maybe that's what they're thinking about, like you know. But so, anyways, check this out: three Russian Jewish oligarchs stepped down from the board of the Genesis Group due to sanctions. Jewish philanthropy that Trio helped fa- uh, found announces their departure, lauds their record of backing Jewish causes group. Um, and they've pledged $10 million to humanitarian relief in Ukraine. So a lot of these Jewish oligarchs in Russia, they're helping the Russians, but they're also helping sort of Jews in Ukraine because a lot of them are philanthropists and they, they do it on behalf of, of their own people, obviously. Um, yeah, it tends to be like a, like a, like a Jewish thing. So, um, they're kind of, again, they're, they're kind of playing both sides. Kind of typical, you know, kind of typical. But um, <laughs> so I, this is out of Times of Israel. Uh, they say Russian billionaires Petra Avon, Mikhail Friedman, and German Khan have stepped down from the board of the Genesis Philanthropy Group, a major funder of Jewish causes founded by the trio. After they were sanctioned in recent days and weeks by the European Union and the United Kingdom. So I correct it. It's not from the U.S. It's actually from the European Union and United Kingdom that the sanctions came from. But, you know, it's kind of Western powers, right? 
The billionaires are among the oligarchs tar targeted by Western sanctions over their long-standing ties to the regime of the Russian President Vladimir Putin. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine now in its fourth week, the crackdown on Russian businessmen and financial institutions has given uh, rise to uncertainty amongst Jewish charities that have increasingly come to rely on them for funding in recent years. Um, so yeah, I mean, you just read this. These are Jewish Russian oligarchs. And so, so that's why you have Israel's, you know, here, this article out of the hill. Israel faces high stakes as Russia go between saying that they're sort of the go between, uh, between the West and Russia. They say out of the hill, Israel has offered to serve as a go-between with Russia and the West as the U.S. and Europe scramble to reinforce Ukraine's resistance against Moscow, against Moscow's un unprecedented assault. So, so yeah, um, and then it goes on to say here. I mean, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Naftali Bennett visited Moscow uh, last week. And this was followed by consultations with European uh, leaders and the Secretary of State, Ant Anthony uh, Blinken, um, yielded no tangible measures in softening Russian President Vladimir Putin's resolve to overrun Ukraine. So you got, you know, okay, Russia won't even let Trudeau in but they're letting the prime minister of Israel in. You can see there's a pretty close relationship here between Israel and Russia, between Moscow and Tel Aviv. There's, or was it Jerusalem now? There's no doubt about it. You know, it's really interesting seeing this, seeing these Western sanctions affect the, the Jewish oligarchs, some of them fleeing to Israel, by the way. And the whole idea that the Azov Battalion are the ones fighting the Russians, right? So you got Israel sort of more on Russia's side. I guess you could say it's a go between. They're kind of neutral, but they're, they're definitely, they're the ones in Moscow right now, last week. They're the ones where the Russian, uh, Jewish oligarchs are fleeing to. They're the ones sort of, you know, just taking money from the West and then going and not even doing anything to help put forth some of these, you know, evil Western elitists, um, um, uh, narratives, right. Or, or, or at least express, uh, any sort of discontent with Putin, right. Yeah. It, it makes you wonder why, it, you know, why, so, so it's like, it, it makes sense why the Ukrainian anti-separatists like the Azov Battalion hate the Russians because they're in bed with the Jews and they hate Jews. So th that's kind of like what's going on, right? That's how I see it. And it's pretty obvious. I mean, you just look at the facts here. It makes sense why they don't like the Russians, you know, um, invading. And just so you know, you're waving your Ukraine flag. This is what you're getting involved in, boys. Like, you want to get involved in this stuff? Fine. You're going to get involved with all this craziness. Hey, Go ahead, go support the Azovs. Yeah, go fight those Russian Jews. Yeah, we don't like them. This is you talking, okay? This isn't just so YouTube knows. This isn't this is I'm not saying nothing. I'm just saying what the media wants you to believe. Okay? They want you to support the guys fighting the the, the Russian Jews and stuff, right? I don't know. And they're they're wearing the Nazi memorabilia. They call themselves Azov. They want to proliferate the white race and all this. Okay. Mm, yeah. Look at this. This is out of uh this is like an alt right sort of neo Nazi website. Um and they're they're promoting exactly what the mainstream media wants, but just with their own twist. Look, they say things like this. This isn't me talking. They are saying things like Putin promoters are fighting for Jewish supremacism and white genocide. <laughs> okay so yeah 
hey, the Attleboro, the 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 um the mayor of my hometown wants to support these people. You know, you're waving your Ukrainian flag. Hey, I don't know. I'm just saying. Look, I'm not like I'm not like uh I'm not like super like judgmental on these things. Like I understand like like some some of you people are, you know, you're crazy, you know? I get it. But whatever. So it just goes on to show that the media is just so and just like these NPCs and stuff, you know, they they, they say they're anti-fascist. They say they're like pro-diversity. They hate Nazis. And then they're just like on a dime like that because the talking heads on TV tell them to, now we support the Nazis. It, again, it's not a judgment on people who support Nazis or people who hate Russians or people who hate Ukraine or people who love Putin. I'm not, I don't take sides in any of this. I'm just saying the hypocrisy of the NPCs of the leftists, of the Democrats, of all these idiots, of the establishment Republicans, the rhinos and neocons, trying to send our people to war in a country that we have zero interest in over some fight between some neo-Nazis and some Russian Jewish oligarchs. Like, give me a freaking break. And I know that's just one sort of, I know I'm sort of, simplifying a very complex issue when I say it like that. Like, of course, there's more to it than, you know, the Azov Battalion and the Jewish oligarchs. I'm just saying there's some influences in here that people aren't considering and that the mainstream media really isn't telling you about and you are all looking like hypocrites supporting one side over the other. So let me know, let me know what you think. That's I just wanted to go over all that today. Um, really interesting stuff. But just remember, this war is escalating. You have Russia uh, using a hypersonic missile now in Ukraine, just upping the ante, moving more and more toward possible nuclear war, which would be devastating, and we don't want that. And I just really worry about it, but hey, you know, you know, I don't think it's... Maybe it will happen, but if it does, it'll be tactical nukes. I don't think it'll be like strategic nukes with a nuke in New York City or anything. You know, it'll probably just be battlefield nukes. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, go send go send the NATO soldiers there, boys. Yeah, just go send the American good old boys, the twenty year olds that know nothing. Just so evil, right? So, in the end, though, it's all about the Great Reset. It's all about this this new world order, Phoenix rising out of the ashes, as they would say. A Great Reset. Just like after World War II, you had the Bretton Woods Agreement and stuff where it's like, oh, now we have a new world order. Now that the war's over and the geopolitical landscape has completely changed, we now have an opportunity to create the new world order, according to Klaus Schwab and his World Economic Forum Great Reset Agenda, Agenda 2030 by the, the UN. It's a world government. Let me know what you think. Links... Below and also uh, leave a comment. Give this video a good thumbs up if you like what you see here. If you think what I provide has value, you can also become a Patreon member. Links for that in the description box below. Um, if you want to contribute to the channel, also follow me on Twitter, Gab, here on YouTube, BitChute, Odyssey, and Rumble. Other than that, it's been Press. Keep your head up, stay real, and no fear.